and welcome to the UK AEA Fusion tutorial series, talk number three. So my name is Tom Wilson. I'm a first year graduate physicist working in jet neutral beams. And today we're going to be talking about how do you heat a fusion machine? So in the first talk, we saw how heating a mix of deuterium and tritium gas up to thousands of degrees would cause it to transition into a plasma state. We then saw if we heated that plasma up further to hundreds of millions of degrees, it would start to produce energy due to fusion reactions. In the second talk, we saw how we could control a hot plasma using magnetic fields and hold it in confinement. And so now we're going to be talking about how we can actually heat our gas up to hundreds of millions of degrees to begin with. So we're going to talk about how do you heat a plasma, what makes a good heating system, and how do you know what the temperature of a plasma is? So we'll talk about the three most common heating systems on tokamaks around the world, which is ohmic heating, neutral beams, and radio frequency heating. We'll also cover a fourth special heating method which occurs naturally, which is called alpha particle heating. So before we talk about the heating methods, we'll just quickly talk about what we actually want from a good heating system. So obviously we want it to be able to heat our plasma up to our target temperature, but there are a couple of other things we want as well. It's imagined a hypothetical fusion power plant would be a pulsed machine, so it'd be turned off and on again periodically and wouldn't run constantly plant will probably hold plasma for about 23 hours a day before spending an hour off again and then restarting and it's imagined this cycle would repeat every day for maybe months at a time. So from this we can see that we want our heating systems to be efficient and we want them to be reliable. We want efficiency because any power we put into our heating systems we necessarily have to take out of any power we can put on the grid. We also want reliability because if our heating system breaks, we can't get our plasma up to temperature, so we can't produce any electricity, so we'll cause a power cut. So these are a couple of things we'll think about when we're talking about the advantages and disadvantages of different heating systems. So with that in mind, we'll move on to our first heating technique, which is ohmic heating. Ohmic heating uses a plasma current to provide heating. This relies on the fact plasmas are made of charged particles which are free to move, which means they're really good at conducting electricity. If we were to connect our pink plasma here up to a battery, we would be able to drive an electrical current through it like a wire. In this case, electrical current means we have lots of charges moving in the same direction. So this sort of idea can be found in things like fluorescent light bulbs. So how does this help us heat the plasma? Well, firstly, we'll just define a little bit of jargon when it comes to measuring electricity. So we use two values, the current and the voltage. So one way to understand these is to think of an electrical circuit as a bit like a water pipe. A battery causes a flow of charge in our electrical circuit in the same way a pump causes a flow of water in our water circuit. The analog of electrical current in this format is the flow rate. For our water pipe, we might measure how many liters of water pass a point per second, which we would call the flow rate. In electricity, we would take a point on our circuit and measure how much charge passes that point per second, which we would call the current, and it's measured in amps. And the analogue of electrical voltage is the water pressure, which is a sort of a measure of how strong our flow is. This is best seen by putting some sort of restriction in our pipe. In this case, we've got a paddle wheel. So you can imagine a very low pressure flow would struggle to get past this paddle wheel, especially if the axle was a bit rusted up, whereas a very high pressure flow would easily turn the paddle wheel and keep moving. So a high pressure or voltage really just means our flow is hard to stop. It's basically a measure of how much energy we have stored in our flow. So voltage is measured in volts. Both of these values are fundamentally linked. If we multiply our current by our voltage, we get the electrical power in our circuit. So the source of this power is the battery. The power in the flow can then be extracted again using some sort of component. So in our water circuit example, we've got this paddle wheel. The power in our water flow is converted by the paddle wheel into a rotation, which we can then use for something else. This relation also means because we fix the power by the source, in this case the battery, we can have a low current high voltage flow or a high current low voltage flow, both of which have the same power. This will be useful when we talk about transformers in a little bit. So a quick recap for the atom from the first talk. So an atom consists of a very small heavy nucleus made of protons and neutrons surrounded by light electrons which orbit the nucleus. The whole thing is net neutral as we have as many positive charges as negative charges. If we were to remove an electron from our atom, the whole thing would then have a net charge, so we'd call that an ion. So what happens when currents flow in a material? Well this is what a metal wire looks like if you zoom in enough. 
from before, we have our red nuclei, which are the red pluses here, and our electrons, which are the blue minuses. The nuclei are pretty much fixed in place. All they can really do is vibrate on the spot, while the electrons are free to flow through the material. So we see our electrical current would be carried by the electrons as they flow in the material. As they do so, every so often they might hit an ion. When it, this happens, the electron gives some of its energy to the ion, which vibrates on the spot. The electron then gets accelerated again by the battery, but again, every so often it hits an ion. So this resistance to it flowing is called electrical resistance and is measured in ohms after the scientist who did a lot of work on it. So every time there's a collision with the wire, it's going to heat up a bit. This means anything with a current flowing through it will also heat up. So what I've just described is the same as a heating element on an electrical cooker. So we pass an electrical current through this heating element, which then heats up because of electrical resistance. So does this apply to the plasma? Well, the plasma looks similar to this, except the ions are also free to move about. Turns out our current will still be carried by our electrons predominantly because they're so much lighter and easier to move. The ions are also still able to be hit by the electrons and move about, so it still has resistance. So now we realise that we can drive a current through our plasma, we can actually heat it up. And this sort of heating is called ohmic heating. The only snag is how we can actually drive a current in our plasma in the first place, because we can't connect it up in a circuit in a traditional way because it's so hot. The solution is the transformer. So a transformer is a device which uses current in one circuit called the primary winding to induce the current in another circuit called the secondary winding. So as transformers don't require the two circuits circuits to touch, we can replace our second circuit with our plasma to an end induce a current in it. So a transformer is really a device which allows us to convert power in one circuit as into power in another circuit. So to understand how a transformer works, we'll get back to our water circuit analogy. So we have our two circuits next to each other connected by the transformer. So for the water circuit, the transformer consists of two paddle wheels connected by gears. The electrical analogue of this would be two inductors next to each other, when in this case an inductor means really we just have a coil of wire. So we see as we have flow in our first circuit, this induces a flow in our second circuit due to the connection through the transformer. Likewise in our top circuit, the current in our first primary winding causes a current in our secondary winding. So. Because a power transformer converts power from one circuit into power in another, and power is just current times voltage, as long as we have current times voltage the same in both circuits, our transformer works properly. What this means is we can change the ratio of current to voltage in our secondary circuit. So one way we might do this in our water circuit is by changing the gear ratio between these gears. The analogue of this in our electrical circuit would be to change the ratio of coils from one inductor to the other. Now when we have our flow, we can see that the flow rate in our secondary circuit has been halved, and likewise the current in our secondary winding has been halved. At the same time, the voltage and water pressure has been doubled. So this is used in power transmission all the time because people don't tend to live near power stations, which means the electricity has to be sent a long way through transmission lines. The current of this signal means the transmission lines heat up and we lose electricity. So one way they minimise this is as the power leaves the power station, it's converted into a very high voltage, low current signal as it's sent through the wires. When it then reaches residential areas, it goes through a substation, which converts it back into a higher current, lower voltage signal, which can then be used in your house. So on a fusion machine, we want to do the latter. We want to massively increase the current at the expense of the voltage. So here's a drawing of the ohmic heating system on JET, which is the Joint European Taurus, which is the world's largest tokamak based in Cullum in the UK. So for JET, we have lots of turns on our primary winding. In this case, we have 540, while our plasma acts as a single turn on our secondary winding. So this means we can drive a 15 or 20,000 amp current through our primary winding and get a three to four million amp current go through our plasma, which then heats up due to a resistance. So this is a really enormous current, so it allows the plasma to heat up to about 80 million degrees. So that's the basics of ohmic heating. 
We use the plasma like a transformer to induce a very large current in it, which then causes it to heat up due to its resistance. So ohmic heating can heat our plasma up to 80 million degrees, which is just over half our target temperature of 150 million degrees. The reason this limit gets imposed is because unlike a normal wire, the hotter a plasma gets, the less resistive it is. This is a very strong effect, so getting to 150 million degrees using just ohmic heating would be too inefficient. So we need some additional heating systems to complement our ohmic heating to reach our target temperature. The first of these is the neutral beams. So the idea behind the neutral beams was that it was collisions that caused the heating in our ohmic heating system. So we could just generate our own fast particles to fire into the plasma without having to generate a plasma current. The basic idea behind this is we're going to duct tape a particle accelerator to the side of our fusion reactor, which sounds a bit crazy, but it turns out to be a very good idea. So a neutral beam consists of three components, the accelerator, the neutralizer, and the bending magnet. So the accelerator is the source of our fast particles. It consists of an ion source, which produces gas ions, in behind a metal grid with lots of holes in it. The metal grid is charged up to very high voltage, in the case of jet, it's 120 kilovolts. As gas ions drift through the holes in front of the grid, which is very, very positive because it's charged to such a high voltage, they get accelerated because light charges repel. A 120,000 volt grid will accelerate a deuterium ion to about 1.5% the speed of light. So here's a picture of such a grid on a jet neutral beam. So if we let our charged particle head towards our fusion reactor as it is, we would have a problem. Our fusion reactor is surrounded by very strong magnetic fields which contain our plasma. And the downside of this is it means anything charged heading towards it gets deflected away. In order for our particle to enter our plasma, we're going to need it to become neutral again so it can pass straight through the magnetic field. So this is the job of the neutralizer. Neutralizer is just a cloud of gas that our beam of fast ions passes through on its way to the reactor. So our gas molecule became an ion back in the accelerator because we removed an electron from it in the ion source. In the neutralizer, we just give it a chance to get that electron back from stealing it from one of the gas molecules. So as our fast ion goes through, there's a probability that it will be able to steal an electron from one of the gas molecules. This means our beam of purely fast ions as it exits the neutralizer will consist of some particles which are neutral and some particles which are charged. The only thing we have to do now is get rid of this charged bit and we'll be left with a purely fast neutral beam. So to do this we use the bending magnet, so we use our own magnetic field to bend out charged particles onto ion dumps, which are these yellow blobs, which are water-cooled bits of metal which absorb their energy. So as our composite beam travels through, it strips out the charged bit and we're left with a purely fast neutral beam. When our fast neutral beam enters the plasma, they will be instantly reionized because the plasma is so hot. So you can see that the blue electron here will be lost. The fast ion will then ping about like a pinball, transferring all its energy to the plasma via collisions before eventually settling down and orbiting just like a normal plasma particle. So in real life, on jet, this entire neutral beam system is over 10 meters long. Here's a picture of it compared to the size of jet, so it's actually comparable to the size of the reactor. There'll also be another one of these systems on the other side. So we have our accelerators, which are the pinnies at the back here. Then we, in front of them, we have our neutralizers, we have our bending magnet and ion dumps, and then our fast beam enters the torus through this duct. So here's uh, the central cryo panel for scale, and here it is compared to some people. We also have another picture from a different angle. So we have our pinny, which are positive ion neutral injectors, which are accelerators, neutralizer, bending magnet, and ion dumps. So neutral beams are crucial components for tokamaks currently, as they deliver most of the heating power. They're complicated bits of equipment on their own right, let alone connected to a tokamak. And they're also a crucial component for ETA, which is the next generation tokamak being built in France. But ETA is going to have beams which will be running their metal grids at 1 million volts, so almost 10 times what JET has. So advantages and disadvantages of neutral beams. 
Well, on jet, the neutral beams can deliver about 32 megawatts of additional heating. So this is enough to boil a bathtub of ice water in about two seconds, power 32,000 street lamps, which is almost a number in London, and also reheat 40,000 curry-ready meals at the same time. This is a lot of power, and the neutral beams deliver it consistently, by which I mean the beams always deliver lots of power to the plasma every time they're fired. The big downside to neutral beams is inefficiency. Jet neutral beams use hundreds of megawatts of electrical power to deliver this 32 megawatts of heating. So that's the neutral beams. We accelerate fast neutral particles and fire them into the plasma. They generate heat through collisions. Another method of additional heating uses electromagnetic waves tuned at specific frequencies, which are broadcast into the plasma, which to cause heating. So this acts quite similarly to a microwave oven, except the waves we send in are tuned to heat plasma particles instead of water molecules. So to start off with, we'll think about a rainbow, which can uh, consists of all the different colours of light, and it's called the spectrum of light. Now light is an electromagnetic wave, and electromagnetic waves can actually vary in frequency, all the way from very high frequency gamma rays down to very low frequency radio waves. So this forms the electromagnetic spectrum of which visible light is just a small component. So for radio frequency heating, we're going to be using waves down the radio and microwave ends of the spectrum. So for example, a microwave oven works at about 2.45 billion Hertz. So here Hertz is a measure of frequency, which is the number of oscillations your wave makes per second. Whereas something like jet radio heating might use waves at 25 to 40 million Hertz though other heating systems use higher and lower frequency waves. So the way this works is we have a radio frequency generator which makes our waves. These are sent along waveguides, which are like pipes for radio waves, to our antennas, which broadcast our waves into the plasma. The antennas are mounted on the wall of the vacuum vessel. So the wave we send in is close to a fundamental frequency that the plasma likes to oscillate at. And when you get two waves at similar frequencies, they transfer energy into each other in something that's called a resonance. In our case, our radio wave gives its energy to the plasma and gets absorbed. So one of the best ways to think about a resonance is pushing someone on the swing. You closely match the frequency you push at to the frequency they're swinging back and forth to maximize energy transfer. So, as we need to get a close match between our wave and our natural plasma frequency, and because natural plasma frequencies depend on all sorts of things like what plasma is made of, how strong the magnetic field is, what direction it's pointing in, and so on, we can theoretically have our wave just absorbed in specific regions of the plasma. For example, we could just have it absorbed here. Even better, we could just have it absorbed in the core, which is the bit that we really want to heat because that's where all the fusion takes place. This is in comparison to something like neutral beams, where in order to heat the core, we have to heat everything in our direct path from our neutral beam duct to the core. So the reason this is possible is because this heating is collisionless. So there are several different resonant frequencies of the plasma and all sorts of different heating schemes to use these resonance frequencies. On JET, we have the ICRH system. So RH stands for resonance heating, and IC is ion cyclotron, which is the name of the frequency of the plasma they're trying to heat using. Eta is also using radio frequency heating, but a different frequency and also a different method to use that frequency. So this is a brief introduction to what's really a massive topic. So here's a picture of one of the RF antennas, marked ICRF antenna B. So you see they look like big radiators. So there are four of these structures around the vacuum vessel. See it from a different angle. You can also see the neutral beam duct in the back, which is where our fast particles stream out of and into our plasma. So the big advantage of radio heating is that because it's collisionless, it's far more targeted than neutral beams. And we can deliver our power where we really want our power to go. You can also use neutral beams in tandem with radio frequency heating to get even better heating system. The downside to radio frequency heating is that it can be quite temperamental and how good your heating is depends quite strongly on the properties of your plasma. On jet, the RF heating is less powerful than the neutral beams, delivering about 10 megawatts at maximum. And in general, radio frequency heating is less efficient than neutral beams for delivering lots of power. So here's some pictures of the RF waveguides in red here. 
So they inject, there's four of these structures around the tokamak, each of which feed the different antennas. So to summarize our heating system, we have ohmic heating, which uses an electrical current in the plasma to heat via electrical resistance. We then supplement this with neutral beam injection heating, while we fire in fast energetic particles into our plasma, and radio frequency heating, where we send in electromagnetic waves close to natural frequencies of the plasma, which are then absorbed and provide additional heating. So now we're going to move on to the method of plasma heating, which is actually most important for fusion, which is self-heating from the fusion reactions themselves. So in the first talk, we saw this, which was deuterium tritium fusion, which produces a neutron and a helium nucleus, also known as an alpha particle. And before we focused on the neutron, because it carries 80% of the energy of this reaction, it can also leave the magnetic field because it's neutral. So this is the bit we might get energy out. However, the alpha particle still has 20% of the energy of the reaction, and 20% of a lot of energy is a lot of energy. This alpha particle can't leave the plasma because it's charged, but what it can do is ping about like a neutral beam particle and heat via collisions. So what this really means is part of our heating is done for us by the fusion reactions. Naturally, the amount of this self-heating scales with fusion power, so bigger reactors with more fusion have a greater proportion of alpha particle heating. This really means is we only need to have the heating systems to get our reaction going, then we can turn them down a bit as our alpha particle heating takes over. With a large enough machine, we could reach a state where we can actually turn off our heating systems completely, with our plasma being heated entirely by its own fusion reactions. This point is called ignition, and our plasma is now called a burning plasma because, like a fire, it's sustaining the reaction by itself, and as long as we keep fueling it, theoretically it would go on forever. Now you might worry we seem to have lost control of this reaction because we no longer control the fusion rate via our heating systems. However, the thing to remember is we still control the magnetic confinement of the plasma. Our fusion power is very strongly related to how good your confinement is. So that means all we need to do is turn down our magnets a bit, reduce our confinement, and we come out of the burning plasma state and into a state like this. So we have control again. So now we're going to quickly talk about how you might actually measure the temperature of the plasma at the end here. So we can't just dip a thermometer into 150 million degree plasma to measure the temperature. And this is actually a characteristic problem of trying to measure anything on a fusion plasma, which is if you want to do it, you have to do it as from as far away as possible and the other side of a vacuum vessel. Now the temperature is really important when it comes to fusion plasmas. It not only determines the rate of fusion, but if you look at how it changes across your plasma over time, you can also figure out all sorts of events which must have happened. So one of the key diagnostics on JET is the High Resolution Thomson Scattering System, or HRTS, which measures the temperature and density of the plasma. So the way this works is we shine a laser beam into our plasma, which then gets reflected off, and we measure this reflected light. So from this we can calculate the temperature, which we'll talk about in a sec. So the lasers used are held in the roof lab uh, above the tokamak. And the reason we use a laser is because we want lots of light at exactly the same frequency. So the way we're going to calculate the temperature is going to rely on something called Thompson scattering. So Thompson scattering is the name of for where light gets reflected off electrons. So we have lots of fast electrons flying about in our plasma. And as our laser light comes in, it gets reflected off it and changes frequency due to something called the Doppler shift. So we know the frequency of the light we put in because it comes from a laser and we measure the frequency of the light we get out. So we can actually measure what this frequency shift is. Using this frequency shift, we can then calculate what the temperature of these electrons must have been. You can also use this system to measure density by comparing the intensity of the light you put in to the intensity of light you measure on the other side of the plasma. You can imagine as your beam of light goes across, every, some of it gets scattered off the electrons, and so the difference between the intensity at the beginning and end must give you an idea of how many electrons there must have been along this path. So that tells you a bit about the density. This isn't the only way of calculating the temperature on a tokamak. On JET there's different another laser system called LIDAR, but this is just a brief introduction to how you might go about measuring something like this. So we're now coming towards the end of the talk. So just to summarize, at the beginning we asked, how can we heat a tokamak? And the answer is we can heat it using ohmic heating, neutral beams, and radio frequency heating. 
we ask, what do we want from a good heating system? And we want heating systems to be efficient and we want them to be reliable. Finally, we asked, how can we possibly measure the temperature of a plasma? And the answer is we can use Thomson scattered laser light. So that's it from me. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you've learned something. Next time, there will be a talk on the challenges of fusion. If you have more questions, you can leave a comment on this video. Alternatively, you can visit the official websites for UK AEA and Eurofusion. You can also email the communications team directly or follow UK AEA on social media.